difficult to believe that we were ne here nearly a year ago when the uh, March 13th, 2020. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, it was a two week period of time, we'll, we'll be back in no time. And here we are a year, almost a year later, and what a journey it's been. Ultimately, I'm very proud of the work that's been done. I'm gonna tell a little bit of that story tonight. But most importantly, I just wanna welcome and thank everybody that's here tonight watching us. Um, just so everybody's aware, the board has been, been, given, been given a copy of this presentation. They've been given a copy of the survey results that went out. Uh, they've been, been given a copy of the comments that were provided by the community to us in that survey. The comments that were provided obviously were anonymous, um, but they do share some good insight on the, on the feedback from, from our residents. So as we do each time, we look to bring our vision and our mission into, the, into everything that we do. And today, of course, that's no different. It's the backbone of everything that we do. So I thought we would get right to the question No better way to start than to get right to the question at hand. So the question is, do we have the ability to bring 100% of our students in for in-person learning? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's what we always do. However, we have to make sure we clearly communicate that this is not a return to normal. In having students return, we have to recognize some things. We have to provide a safe and effective learning environment we have to bring sustainability and resiliency into our plan. And we also have to be fiscally responsible to our community. So I wanna take a little bit of a history uh, through, if you don't mind, way back when, when it was clear that we were closed, our, our school doors were closed for the remainder of the year, we jumped and created the HF Ready Task Force. And that task force is made up of staff members, community members, board members. And we brought together everybody and we created a plan. And that was the reopening plan. And that's the plan that we're here to discuss tonight. The timeline of this plan, if you look at the presentation back in May, we started our work and it was very important work. We, we couldn't have done it without everybody together. So we're really proud of the work that was done to get us to that reopening plan. And we didn't know, if you think back to August, when we were about to set forth an open school, there were a lot of questions. Could we, could we keep school open? Is school gonna remain open? Will our model work? School districts had different models and it was, it was really certainly uncharted territory. But here we are, we're, we're March 10th and our program has been very successful. I'm extremely proud of that. We are in, looking at a historical perspective of the positive cases um, at Harborfields. So over the uh, start of the year, we experienced, of course, some cases. And then, of course, there was an uptick in the number of cases. And when you look at January, January is a particularly challenging period of time. We had 85 cases. We quarantined over 100 students. And we quarantined 52 staff members. When I say we quarantine, obviously, Suffolk County Department of Health quarantine those individuals. But that's a difficult thing because when you have staff members that are quarantined, it makes it very difficult to operate the school building. Um, so we, we learned a lot. We went through some challenging time and I really have to thank our administrators who unfortunately became very good at the contact tracing process and very efficient with that. And we managed to stay open. Not one day did we shift to remote instruction during that period of time. And it was a struggle, but again, our administrators love our kids so much. They know they need to be in school and they work to make those things happen. And so we were able to stay open through those really, really challenging times. And it, it was tough. So if you look at Suffolk County rates, you see the, a similar trend that we went through. And certainly when you look at positivity rates in Greenlawn, and you go and you look at positivity rates in Centerport, those trends obviously were very consistent. But we have to celebrate. We have to celebrate our successes. And again, I go back to that task force of 
residents, PTA, SEPTA, everybody came together, all the community organizations, our board members, our teachers, our teacher assistants, everybody. I don't wanna leave anybody out. Everybody came together on that task force and developed a plan to make that our school successful. And we have to celebrate that. A reopening plan was adopted and ratified by the Board of Education in August. We had live synchronous instruction from day one. And I'll just give you just a little hint. My own children still don't have that. If they're quarantined, they don't get live instruction. We reimagined school events in ways that never before have we ever imagined those things would happen. And we did that together. It was really a team effort to keep our school safe. Thanking our custodians, our nurses, our TAs, our teachers, our security guards, everybody, food service workers, everybody involved in that whole, that whole time. Uh, we, we really came together. And again, the contact tracing with the administrators, keeping our schools open for in-person learning. We really should hold our heads up high and celebrate those successes. And that brings us to today. Where are we today? Well, obviously we've been thankful to experience some decreasing positivity rates. We went from 85 cases in January to 18 in February. We're sneaking up on that number right now in March. So we gotta be careful, but we are seeing decreasing positivity rates in the community as well. But the guidance and the regulations have not changed. There's still the social distancing requirement of six feet or barriers with 100% mask compliance. There's still the social distancing of 12 feet in band, orchestra, chorus, physical education. We still have the contact tracing requirements. Any individual within six feet for greater than 10 minutes. And increasing the density of individuals obviously will result in more quarantines. We've listened to our students. I've held super, what I call superintendent roundtables at OMS in the high school, listening to the students and what they had to say. And certainly the community most recently in our survey that went out. So I'm just gonna go through the survey results with everyone. I have to say, as a, both a doctoral student and in doing some research, obviously do a lot of surveys and you don't normally get survey results like this, responses. We had a tremendous response from our community. And that tells you right there that this is certainly an issue that we care deeply about. So we had a very good response. You can see the red line represent, representing the enrollment at each grade level and the blue bar representing the responses for each grade level. So when you break that out into a pie chart and you include the unknowns, there was a significant number of unknown responses, but you can kind of extrapolate how those responses might play out based on the, the, the larger number of responses that we got from the community. When you break that pie chart down into a graph, a bar diagram, you see that there's a, you know, the, when the learning preference by grade level, uh, the majority of the grade levels in the responses chose the in-person. Of course, a lesser amount chose hybrid as their learning preference, and an even smaller amount chose remote as their learning preference. When we looked at folks that said that they're currently hybrid, what their learning preference would be, this was the response that we got. Again, the majority of those responses indicated that they wanted in-person learning, that they would prefer that with a smaller percentage of those responses indicating that they would like to stay hybrid and a very, very small amount indicating they would like to go remote. When you ask folks that are currently remote what their learning preference would be, you see that the majority chose, would choose to stay remote. However, some indicated that they would either like to go hybrid or like to go full in-person. So that provided us with very good information to go by uh, in moving forward with any plan to bring students to in-person learning in grades six to 12. The informational survey results also included comments. 
So what I've done here is just briefly, very briefly, because again, there were hundreds and hundreds of comments, just summarize those into some categories. There were a lot of comments related to the return to in-person and the benefit to academics, the needs, uh, physical and social emotional health. There were comments related to if change is needed, they would prefer, people would prefer a gradual approach to that change. There were concerns about community spike in positivity rates. There were concerns about the impact of variant virus strains. And there were concerns about the additional quarantines that bringing students back to in-person would present. And just as a, as a context, this survey was provided um, at the end of February after the break, right? So what I would like to do is discuss with the community what in-person in -person learning would look like. To paint a real picture of that would, so that parents and guardians can make choices that are right for them and their family. So what we did was we literally went around, and I'm sure your children have told you when they came home, that desks are being moved, tables, tables put in cafeterias, um, things, were, things were moving. So we moved desks, and I have to thank our custodians because they've been really patient with us as we moved desks from classroom to classroom to classroom. And we measured and we repositioned and we, we did everything we could to make sure that we had each, year, each room calculated out to where it needed to be. And so what I wanna paint the picture of is that we're providing a context of 100% return if all students return to in-person learning, what that would look like. So if the most condensed classroom, the most, you know, the most populated classrooms at OMS in the high school, we're looking at students with, in rows with barriers, three feet apart front to back. And there would be a barrier on the desk between those students. The desks, you know, when we, if, you know, we move forward with the plan, any student that does not return to in-person learning, that desk would be removed, obviously, and we would look to increase the distance between the students. In addition, what I painted here is the, is the most populated rooms. However, not all rooms look like this. So this is a, this is a minimum. Um, I also wanna point out to the public that the picture that you're seeing, obviously the barriers are not yet installed. The barriers uh, arrived to us yesterday um, and they would need to then be installed. So they're not installed yet on these, on these desks, but there would be barriers. If anybody's familiar with our elementary program, we've been in person since day one and our elementary students have barriers on their desks and they are in you know, similar distance um, in our elementary program since September. In our cafeterias, in our cafeterias, we have students um, in rows with desk barriers. Students will be four feet apart front to back, again, with a barrier between them, and six feet maintained between rows to make sure we have that distancing. Because again, we know obviously, it goes without saying that students eat with their masks off. So we wanna make sure we have that distance there. Uh, again, the barriers are not pictured but we're looking at overflow spaces if we need to, and of course, exploring outdoor spaces um, as well. At OMS, the picture looks like this. So if I go back to the high school for a second, the science tables, as you see, are long tables. We can't use those in classrooms. They're too, they consume too much space. So we're using them in the cafeteria to, be, to try, to, try to be creative with spaces. Um, so that's where, that's where we got those tables from. And we had to order desks to put into the science rooms, but I'll get to that later. The uh, cafeteria at OMS, as you see here, is a little bit more spread out because our um, enrollment is a little bit lower uh, at OMS and we're able to spread them out. The cafeteria is a different dimensions. We're able to spread them out a little bit more, but we do have in some cases, and again, I'm painting the picture of 100%, four feet between students front to back with six, six feet between rows but again, barriers would be used. So those are the cafeteria spaces. The hallways, right now we 
employ one-way directional hallways and one-way stairwells, those will remain. Um, and if anybody's familiar with the layout of the high school, the students uh, at certain aspects of parts of the building have the ability to use outside walkways. And that would be permitted to allow them to get walk to class outside when weather permits uh, to avoid being in hallways. But those uh, one way directional hallways are certainly going to remain. And music and I'm sorry, music and physical education classes. Obviously, we were looking to maintain that 12 feet of distance. But again, just as we did in the fall, we'll be utilizing outdoor spaces uh, for our physical education classes and music classes so that we can continue those the wonderful work that they're doing. And of course, with the art and the technology and family consumer science classes, uh, we continue to not share materials between students. In the area of transportation, uh, because that of course came up as a concern on the, on the survey, we used current ridership data and currently our bus ridership is very low. So if we look at that data, it shows that for the most part, our students would not need to share a seat on the bus at the current levels. However, in some cases it would. And so what we're requiring is that students who would live in the same household or siblings would sit together and be required to sit together on buses to avoid having students share seats. But again, if we see a full return and students take advantage of the busing that we offer, that may be required to share seats with another child. In that case, we'll work to stagger seats to try to minimize uh, two students sitting next to two students. And of course, mask wearing will be enforced. This is a conversation that we continue to have with our bus drivers to make sure that if the child is not obeying the uh, requirement to wear their mask on the bus, that the child be referred to the building administration and that would be handled by them for non-compliance. You know, students could lose the uh, privilege of riding a bus for a period of time if they're not compliant. So what are the other concerns expressed about returning to in-person learning? Well, obviously the increased density of individuals within a space is a concern because a positive case would result in, through the contact tracing process, additional quarantines. Of course, the contact, contact tracing process itself becomes very, very complex when you have that many individuals in a building. And of course, implementing all the safety pr protocols that we have, that we need to have. Of course, making sure that our staff is adequately uh, provided to supervise all the new students entering the building, ensuring that the cleaning and sanitizing happens with the increased touch points. So, uh, all the furniture that we had taken apart in, in the summer months to make room and make space. Now we have to put a lot of that together. We had to purchase additional desks. As I said before, a normal science classroom filled with science tables now is gonna be filled with desks so that we can maximize the space between students. Of course, looking at the impact on the food service with our cafeterias and the, and the food service that happens there and our transportation op operations, purchasing the barriers and of course installing them where six feet cannot be maintained. So the question could be given all these changes, why these concerns, why change now? So it goes back to, and I was asked this question and I thought it was a great question, what, what are our goals with this? So our goals obviously are to address the academic needs of our students, to address the social emotional needs of our students and to make sure we're supporting all students. What has changed is certainly the decline in positivity rates that I went through. We have demonstrated success, especially at the elementary level, we've been full in since day one. And of course the vaccine rollout does provide a bit of, uh, a bit of relief. So, what are the possible timelines for, for success? Before I get into this question, I just wanna make clear that we're having this conversation with our Board of Education for the first time. And I'm expressing a timeline that I feel that we can meet successfully, but obviously what has to happen next is if, you know, the discussion. 
And once the discussion happens, if any change is made to our reopening plan, the board would need to act on that uh, in a resolution at the March 17th meeting. So I just wanna make that clear that these timelines are not something that the, the public should consider uh, done at the moment. We need to have this discussion. So I'm proposing a timeline in phases. The first phase will be what we're referring to as a senior experience. Our 12th grade students during the week, week of March 22nd will come into school. The issue is the desks that we ordered at the end of February have not yet arrived. They're not scheduled to arrive until March 26th at the earliest, March 29th, I'm told, the latest. I won't be comfortable until I call my vendor and I know that they're on the truck. But the senior experience will allow seniors to come in during the week of March 22nd before we get the desks. We do have enough desks that I can situate them in the South Gym. They'll have an opportunity to, to be there, but they won't begin to attend classes until April 5th. So I'm gonna come back to the senior experience. So as I said, they'll come into the, uh, to the South Gym on their virtual days. On their in-person days, they continue attend classes. On their virtual days, instead of being at home and participating virtually, they'll come into school and participate from the South Gym. But during their time, there's other things that they can do. Because I have a junior at home and he would ask this question. He would say, well, why? Why would I want to come in on my virtual day when I could be home? Well, we're working with our student government and our leadership classes to plan senior events. This is a good time of year, come in and be able to be a part of that, plan senior events. Where some space that permits, students may be able to attend classes. We're having conversations with our PE teachers if they do go outside, certainly our seniors can join them. But again, if, and I know there are teachers out there that say I have a senior who owes me some work, I can go to the gym and get that, that student if I want. The student can also attend athletics, clubs, extra help, all that in person. Certainly they can use the library, make an appointment to see their counselor. Of course, the socialization piece, that's a big piece of why, why do this? Like why, why are we extending ourselves to say, bring the seniors in March 22nd when we don't yet have the desks in place? We want them to be in as soon as possible. And we can do this for them on the 22nd. So we're gonna have that South Gym set up if uh, all goes as planned and be able to bring our seniors in. What we've also done is work with our school counselors and I have to thank them for clearing their schedules that week. And they're gonna meet with their caseload of students, their seniors, and they're gonna bring them into the auditorium and have conversations with them about the end of the year, transition to college, supporting them um, in, the, in the work that needs to be done. Anything that they can do to help our seniors, uh, they're gonna do it and they're gonna be available for them. There are opportunities also for individual appointments. So we're very grateful to our counselors for, for being available for our students as always. So that's phase one. Phase two, and again, desks arrive March 26th, 29th. Our custodians do a mammoth job of getting all the desks in place, putting barriers in place, taping, you know, putting the clips on the, on the desks and putting all 3,450 barriers in place. And we bring in students the following week. So like I said before, our seniors will start to attend classes April 5th. Our sixth grade and 11th grade will come in on April 6th and attend classes. And just as a reminder, all grades should continue to attend their in-person days, but as their grade level phases in, obviously they'll come in in person every day. And then phase three, we're gonna provide a day of relief just to make sure that everything is operating the way we want it to. So April 7th, there'll be no transition, but April 8th, we'll bring in grades seven and 10. And April 9th, we'll bring in eight, grades eight and nine. And again, if, if all goes well, I'm not against 
calling homes on April 6th and saying everything went well, let's come in on the 7th. But right now, this is the projected timeline. Again, the timeline for success. And I just want to reiterate that those, num those dates can change. So what instructional models are being proposed? In order to provide an effective learning environment for all students at OMS and the high school, the hybrid option is not going to be available. And I know that we received a lot of feedback in the, in the survey regarding hybrid. And we feel that it is educationally sound to provide an environment where our students can return to in-person learning five, five days a week. And we wanna support that. Um, people express concerns about the density of individuals in quarantine. And unfortunately, offering hybrid is not really gonna solve that if we have students in in person every day of the week. So we want our kids in school. And this is the, the decision that's been made. So parents, we're gonna be asking you to fill out a form tomorrow. If again, things go well with the board and our discussion here about selecting either in-person or remote learning. But we also understand that we need to provide flexibility in this process. So we know we, know we need to do that. And I just wanna reiterate that our in-person students will continue to be provided with live remote instruction in the cases that they're quarantined. So during those periods of quarantine, they will be provided live instruction. Not for illness, but for quarantine, right? The illness is quarantine related, yeah. So the flexibility that we're gonna provide. So as I indicated, if all goes well, we'll be sending a commitment form home and we'll be asked to select one instructional model. Any family that chooses remote, and again, going back to the survey and the comments in the survey, parents expressed concern about coming in person with that many individuals. So any family that chooses remote is going to have an opportunity to switch to in-person on two dates. And we offered two week windows, April 19th and again on May 3rd, because a parent may say, I don't know how this is going to go. I want my child to start remote. And then what I'm anticipating is we're very successful and students want to start coming back in. And they'll have the opportunity to do that on April 19th and again on May 3rd. Also understanding that our elementary parents might be impacted by this decision if it's made to return students in grades six through 12 to in-person learning. We also wanna provide them a window of opportunity to return their elementary age students to in-person learning if they're currently remote. We understand that some secondary students may watch their younger siblings at home. And so we wanna provide that opportunity. So we're gonna do that effective April 5th but also we're gonna to look to provide additional windows for our elementary folks in the future should they wish, wanna to switch to in-person learning. We always wanna welcome our students back. So the, that information will be communicated by the buildings for our elementary folks. So again, we're providing this flexibility to meet the needs of all our families and to support them during this period of transition. So here's the summary of the proposed timeline. And I wanna share with the community is that this obviously is being recorded. It'll be posted to our website. This presentation will be posted to a website. It will be sent along with any commitment form, again, uh, that comes out, but that will, uh, that will all be communicated. So here's a summary of the timeline. We're looking at, again, what I'm looking for consensus from the board tonight is that if we, we do want to proceed in some direction that I would need to send home a commitment form to our families and that could happen as early as tomorrow. At the March 17th meeting, I want to be able to present to the board that my desks are on time, everything's installed, my staff is ready, we're doing everything right and we're, we're good to go and be able to recommend a resolution to adopt a revised reopening plan at the 17th meeting. If that goes well, then on the 18th, we communicate the official timeline to our families. March 22nd, senior experience begins at the high school. And again, the phase in April, uh, April 5th, April 6th, April 8th, April 9th. And the two flexibility dates that we currently have right now 
for our secondary students. So the question might be, what could delay your timeline? If there's anything, what could delay your timeline? So here's some things that, and they're not many, I'm not concerned about, really I'm concerned about one of them, two of them. But the first one here, the desks. Again, they're scheduled to arrive, 420 desks, uh, March 26th through the 29th. So those, those desks will be here. Uh, and if they're delayed, that could impact the timeline. But again, I'll be communicating all the way. My hope is that on the 17th, right before the board meeting, I'm able to call my vendor and confirm that they're on a truck headed for our buildings. And we're able to make the recommendation that we could stick to the timeline. I'll know more certainly on the 17th. We are um, almost complete with this project, installing additional Wi-Fi access points for our South Gym. As Mr. Ambrosio who's here recording this meeting could tell you, sometimes when we live stream for our South Gym, the, the Wi-Fi is not the best. So what we did was we installed two additional access points down there to make sure that we can, we can support potentially 130, 150 students in that, in that room. And of course, the third point uh, is an unexpected increase in positive cases. Those are, pay attention to those emails that are coming in. We had four yesterday and we're hoping that that was just a blip, uh, but if that trend continues, that's certainly something that would be concerning. Uh, but uh, again, the official timeline will be shared at the March 17th meeting. So that concludes the, the, the presentation portion of this. Um, I'm looking forward to the board discussion. So I have uh, my team, but I want to thank uh, Ms. Rayner, Ms. Ballin, Ms. Donnelly. Um, they, along with our principals, everybody, have been at this uh, for such a long time, and we are so happy to be here at this point of presenting this plan. And we're looking forward to, uh, for, for, to the discussion, but thank you to my team. Did a great job with this. So um, open for discussion, Ms. Lustig. Thank you, Dr. Manning. I know I personally appreciate the thoroughness that went into this presentation. And I would like to give my thanks and appreciation um, to everyone, not only in the central administration, but also in all the buildings. This is really a complex um, process because as you know, we only have our four buildings. We don't have a lot of additional space. So it is um, a complicated process in order to make this work within um, the safety guidelines. And we appreciate the methodical process also um, with evaluating the positivity rates um, and making sure that we could create a plan that would be workable before it was presented uh, to the community. So I really ap appreciate all the thoughtfulness that went into this. What I'd first like to do is um, go around and have um, board members have their questions answered and then afterwards if any board members would just also like to make um, a comment. So I'll start with questions. Dave. Thank you, Susie. Um, first of all, uh, my gratitude to the entire uh, administration and staff who worked on this plan. Um, it's a continuation of the tremendous work that has gone on to reopen our schools in, in uh, <coughs> September um, and get us to where we are today and for us to have the successes we've had. And when I look at this plan, um, it seems it's an extension almost of that work, right? Um, where the Department of Health has recommended three basically protective measures for us to put in place, which would be the masks, barriers, or distance, and that distance guideline being six feet. And uh, the guidance stating that to have one of those three in place would be adequate and sufficient for a school to do that. We have, in, in certain instances, have had at least two of those three in place up until this point, right. so that in, in, in certain areas like our classrooms where students are wearing masks and the desks currently are at six feet, two of those three barriers, protective barriers are in place. And that's been part of the recipe for success uh, to this point. And it does seem that in this plan, we are staying true to that and we're kind of shifting that a bit. So by adding the barriers into the classrooms and reducing the distance, we're still maintaining two out of the three barriers within the classroom. Right. So that from the safety standpoint, as per guidelines, the kids are safe, 
right? The kids are safe from that transmission within that space. In terms of our hallways, although they'll be more dense, we still though currently have one of those three protocols in place. We try to maintain two and that sometimes may be a little bit difficult, right. but the amount of time that they would actually be face to face with each other in the hallway is, is well under that 10 minute time and, and I, I don't know exactly how many minutes the passing time is that I imagine it's five or yeah. six minutes yeah so right so so that well under that time so we're maintaining their safety within that space as well and the cafeterias as well make by maintaining the, the six feet between the rows and the barriers on the desks again with masks and although students would temporarily have their masks down while they eat but when they're not eating the mask would be up again the safety is maintained in that space right you know, giving us confidence that the students are safe and, and safe from transmitting, uh, uh, you know, the, the virus to one another. And then of course, then potentially taking it home with them right. and, and threatening uh, anybody at home with that. And, you know, the one that stood out to me, it was really transportation because that's, that's you know, really a challenge uh, on the bus. Right. And uh, that's an area where I just, you know, we just need to be very mindful and ensure that those kids that do take the bus, um, you know, are wearing their masks and staying distant on the bus so we can stay within those guidelines because there are cases where some students could be on the bus 30, 35 minutes. And if they're sitting next to each other, they still have the mask on. Right. So if they have the mask on and they're next to each other for 30 minutes, by guidelines, they're fine and they're safe. Right. right. And as long as our bus drivers are ensuring that the masks are staying on, they're staying on top of that right. by periodically checking, you know, as they're driving, then we should be OK. So by that measure, I, I, I think this is a, a, a fantastic plan and it's going to take like everything else we do, you know, a collaborative commitment by all of us involved, that being not just us as a board, not just the administration, the, the faculty, the staff, but as a parent myself as a parent, you know, and then my kids as well, taking on that personal responsibility here. So um, it's not really a question, more so just, you know, a comment um, uh, about the thoroughness of this plan um, and the confidence that I have in, in, in what uh, you and your team have put together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Joe, you had a question? Yes, I, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, the model that we have right now, which is hybrid or fully remote has worked very well for six months. And, it, and in this plan, we're moving to in-person and or remote. Um, did we consider continuing the hybrid as a third model? Um, if so, why are we not moving forward and continuing that? What were the issues with that? We're continuing both the three of them, hybrid, in-person and remote at the same time. That's a, that's a good question. You know, we did see that. We saw that certainly in the survey results. You have them before you. We saw that in the comments. The model we have is working. It's working very well. When it came down to discussions with faculty, we, we talked about this a lot. And we went around. Um, and I was asked a very pointed question. I referred to it in the, in the presentation. What are our goals with this? What are our goals? So when you put it like that, our goals, of course, and I talked about it in the presentation, are to support the academic needs, the social emotional needs, make sure we're serving the needs of every student, every child. And we know that the best way to do that is to have them in person. Uh, it's what we do, it's what we've always done. And so when you explore the hybrid option, or you explore all three options, I should say, in a setting, what you, what you find is that what I believe the person that was, would like to consider remote is trying to achieve perhaps is, is less exposure. But I don't know that you achieve that because every other day you're still coming into school or, or two days, sometimes three days a week, you're still coming into school with a large number of individuals. So going back to our, our, our basic goals of meeting the needs of all kids, we know that in-person learning is the best for them. And so the decision was made that if we're going to move forward in this direction, we would recommend not moving, not continuing the hybrid option for that reason. Okay, I have, I have one more, more question. Sure. And that is about, have we looked at putting tents outside 
for additional space as the weather's warming up for both either the caf to expand our cafeteria area as well as just places for our students to go um, during their free periods. So the, the issue with tents um, are, are just a couple. Uh, obviously the, the expense of them is one thing, but the other piece of it is the fact that when you put a, a tent up, a structure up, um, you have to make sure that that obviously is, is a safe space. Uh, but for example, for lunch, you still have to make sure that the students are socially distanced. And especially if they're, if they're eating with their masks off under, under a tent. And I imagine, um, you know, so we would have to provide supervision under those, uh, in those spaces. But yes, we have explored the using tents. I'm not saying that we haven't. It is something that we are considering moving forward with. Uh, we just have to think of, of all the parameters that that would that putting a tent on the on the property would create. Um, our students K to 12, I'm sure your, your children tell you, they all use outdoor spaces. Our, our students spent a lot of time outside in the fall um, at the elementary level and the secondary level. As a former high school principal, I could tell you our students eat outside quite a bit um, and it's great to see. Um, but yes, we have explored tents and it's something we are continuing to look at. Okay, thank you very much. Chris, go ahead. Hi, uh, Dr. Manning, thank you for the presentation. Thank you everyone uh, that put in the effort to, to put this together and to push us to the next step here. I know, you know, we, we had, a, I, I think our plan has been very successful that we've implemented and um, I feel like we've, just getting in a groove. We want to enjoy that groove, but uh, you know, you got to, this is the year to double down and work and just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. So I appreciate all the efforts uh, by, by you, the administrators, the students, parents, everybody. So um, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you. Um, I have a couple questions to, to your hybrid question. I, was, I had the same question about why, why can't we have that hybrid model? I think, you know, we're in a, in a world right now where everybody is assessing their risk tolerance really is, is how much risk are they willing to take? Yeah. And, you know, we, we've been in that mode now for a year and I, I, I hear your point. I, I can appreciate sort of teacher scheduling and, and managing who's coming, who's in, who's going where. I, I absolutely appreciate that difficulty. Um, also appreciate your point that if you, if you do, if you stick with hybrid, you're not really, you're not really changing anything, but you are, you know, you reduce your days if you're going in two days a week or three days a week, you know, you are out days and, and there's a potential that somebody has COVID in the class on Monday, the day you're home and, you know, there's kids in that class that have to quarantine, but because you were home, you know, you, uh, you didn't roll the dice that day, you know, so your risk is mitigated a little bit just by being out. Um, but uh, so, uh, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. I guess I'm just trying to make that point that, that that's what people would want to just Understood. Reduce and then, a little bit and not have to go full home if they're, if they're right. not willing to take the, the you know, the, the dive in. And I can understand that. I think that we, you know, in our experiences in contact tracing, we're doing a 48 hour look back. All right. So it's going to capture two days in that case. So if you're lucky enough to grab a weekend, okay, maybe that's the case. But in most cases, you're going to be trapped in a two day window look yeah. back. Okay. The other piece of it too is on, on the, and, you know, on the side of the child, we know that our students are struggling. We know that it's, a, it's a challenging academically to, to be um, learning from a device at home. It's, a, it's hard, it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. And so we have to be mindful of the fact that pre-COVID, we demanded our students to be in school and we, they weren't in school. We, we did home visits and we did everything we could to make sure that we got them in school. Yeah. And so it, we have to go back to our kind of our roots there and understand that, you know, students are best served in school and we believe we provide a safe environment for them to do that. And if we have those beliefs and we have those understandings, then in-person is the way that we want yeah. students to be. And again, we understand all those concerns and um, have grappled with them through our conversations with faculty and, and students and staff and, and everyone. Um, and we, we you know, came back to that question I was asked, what are our goals? 
And I just, I okay. it drove me right to, you know, drove all of us and really focused that conversation about why in person is the model that we would like. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions, but you can cut me off anytime you want. I'll, I'll come back to them. But um, I, I would like to ask one more just quickly. The, so um, just because that was really Joe's question, it was a follow up to Joe's. So this is my first question. Um, <laughs> the Senate rules, yes, I like to, the gentleman from Greenlawn. Um, the current, so can you walk me through, uh, you know, I know I've spoken with Maureen about this and um, sort of the current, you know, you, you get somebody, you, know, you get a case, right? A, a student has COVID, right? And the protocol now is, you know, we, I know they ask the questions, well, you know, tell me about the room, right? Though we're six feet apart, we're wearing masks, you know, um, so that kind of dictates who is quarantined. Will, will that change drastically? That sort of when, when we have a case, how is the new environment going to change, you know, who's going to get quarantined? Chris, the, the rules uh, still have not changed. So it's within six feet for 10 minutes or more. Uh, those individuals are considered close contacts and are quarantined. Um, so the, the process remains the same. We still report those individuals to yep. the Department of Health and they're quarantined. The d increase in the density of individuals in a space would quarantine more individuals. So currently, for example, at our elementary level, when you have a positive case, you're quarantining more students that are in that circle mm -hmm. than certainly at the secondary level, as you know, Dave said, where you're, you're six feet apart, when you draw that circle around that student for that particular class, those individuals are not in that circle and they're not considered close contacts. Okay. Um, and so we, those, that remains the same. How it changes the process, it becomes very, very challenging. You know, so we, for example, um, will continue to deploy those QR codes in the cafeteria where the student has to sign in to, you know, using technology into a particular seat. So we know where they're sitting, we know who's around them. Cer certainly the teachers maintain this, their seating charts. Um, we do all those things and we are able to contact trace and that's how we've gotten very efficient at the contact tracing mm -hmm. process and be able to keep our buildings open. Uh, but it is going to it is going to be a challenge. I'm not going to lie. It is one of the things that uh, is concerning about the, the program is that um, and folks need to understand this is that when we return our students to in person, if there is a positive case um, with school exposure, meaning that positive student or staff was in school, it will result in more quarantines. Again, we've seen this at the elementary level. Um, the, the only thing I can say to the folks that are listening that maybe don't have elementary aged students is that we, you know, we've been through that process and what we're, we're not seeing is that spread within schools, even with our close contacts. Mm -hmm. And so that's an important thing to understand as David said, talked about, we try to get two of those three barrier things in place, the, the mass, the distance or the barrier. Uh, so we, we put two or three of those things. We have a very safe track record of preventing spread within schools, if at all, right? Have the guidelines changed or how long you were quarantined for? Is it still um, 10 days, 10 days, right? 10 so days. I just want to, I want everyone to be eyes wide open here, right? Yep. We are, you know, we're going to have all students in, uh, they're going to be closer. The possibility, I mean, we're all eager to get back in school as much as possible. I think everybody on, on the entire survey wants to get back in school eventually. Yeah. Um, nobody wants to, to do this remotely, but yeah, you got eyes got to be open, right? You, you, as eager as you are to get in school, you could find yourself home for two weeks uh, online. But, but, but if I could just, you know, th that's a quarantine you could be home on. That's yeah. not because you transmit it. And I think there's two different things here. And right. I think it's important that we make that distinction because right. a quarantine doesn't mean that you're unsafe. It means that you were just within that zone, right? And, right. and the, the point that Dr. Manning brought up about the transmission we're not seeing the transmission in the school because the students are really doing what they need to do in terms of wearing their masks. So although right. they might be sent home to quarantine, they're not, we're not seeing so, the spread because they, they are wearing the mask. So they're still maintaining, you know, two of those three barriers, the mask, you know, if the distance breaks down, they still have the mask. Right. My, my goal is to maximize the amount of time you are in school 
And if you are quarantining at home, you are not in school. So no, un that, no, that's, totally you know, that's, understood. that's all I'm thinking about yeah. is, you know, we want them in school and we want them in school as much as possible. And I, I just don't want to backfire and find ourselves. Uh, with but one of the most home. important ways that we can accomplish that is a community. It's a community partnership. And since we know that the majority of the way or most of the, if not all of the way that um, we're finding positive cases in school is really from outside um, activities. We, if, if we as a community want to keep our schools open and go the distance, we need everyone to partner with their activities outside of, of school. I mean, that's, I think, the most important message we need to, you know, get out to the community when we see that in some of our surrounding school districts, um, they're opening and then they're having to close, but they're having to close because there were big parties and gatherings on the weekends, you know, and we don't want to be here to be lecturing everyone has the right to make their own choices in their in their life but their the collateral damage of some of the outside activities w could be that more people will be quarantining um steve you had a question yeah thanks uh susie sorry it's a little close to me i guess uh so just to take it away from the hybrid i do have some questions about hybrid learning uh, dr manning but um when it comes to the busing i just wanted to find out if there's any kind of uh, mandate that if folks do decide to have their kids come back to school full time are they also committing to being to riding the bus full time or can they still transport their kids separately? It's a great question. No, they can certainly drop students off. OK, um, and we evaluated that. Obviously, we're going to anticipate that the traffic in front of the schools is going to be increased and there's going to be an adjustment period, just as we saw at Washington Drive and TJL uh, at the beginning of the year. So as, as you know, more students, more parents and uh, come in and drop off the children. We're going to ask for patience in those things, but yeah. we know that we have, uh, you know, clear uh, systems in place at Washington Drive in the high school. Certainly, the high school we have three different parking lots, drop-off zones uh, here at OMS too. So we have, uh, you know, we have all those same concerns, and that's why we did that phased in. We put a day in between the first set of grade levels that are coming in, just to provide an adjustment period where if we need to adjust transportation. Um, or the or the flow within the parking lots, or if we need to adjust, you know, the, the temperature scanning that happens at the doors, those things that we can do those adjustments and give ourselves a, a grace period to do that. Great, great. Yeah, obviously, because with the way things have gone uh, with the kids that are in school, uh, there's still obviously a lot of car traffic, and that's going to obviously increase, you know, exponentially yes. uh, with this move. So just to make sure that we're kind of planning for, um, you know, the inevitable there, right. uh, realizing that will be a challenge. And all I want to say is if you are going to carpool, wear your mask. Right. <laughs> windows open too would be windows a good help. It's, it's going to be the springtime. So uh, windows open. Sounds right. Uh, and then just, you know, I was kind of thinking about this uh, from a social emotional aspect uh, as kids return back to school. And this will be, you know, kind of uh, to some extent, I, I think that we're, we're expecting this to be a lot of joy and I'm sure there will be. But will, do, you, do you expect that there would be any need for, um, you know, kind of social backstop for kids uh, as they return to school and they return to interaction, they return to socialization and all the things that go along with that uh, positive and negative that um, we're thinking about, you know, the effect of, you know, a everybody back in school kind of scenario again and what that does for kids that may have challenges there. So that's a great, great question. And one of the reasons why I'm so happy that this is this is happening now. Again, I go back to January and you asked me in January, I never thought we would be here right now, but yeah. Here we are, and this is the reason. I have children at home, school-age children, three of them, and uh, I know this answer. I know this this question is on the mind of a lot of our parents. Yeah, uh, and it's it's very important. Obviously, we know that one of the you know as as hard as this has been all year long, we know a lot of the real hard work is going to be when we get our students back, and this is one aspect. In addition to academics, the socialization uh, piece of it. Uh, we, we have a lot of work to do. So um, like I said, with our counselors at the high school, certainly our counselors at the middle school are well aware of the work that needs to be done and, and are prepared to do that. Uh, we have to look at, at those things uh, that need to, need to happen to increase the socialization. So we're happy to get uh, students back in the room. I've seen such amazing things that our teachers are doing within the classroom uh, to drive student connection. And I'm sure that's gonna continue. The, the work that they've done, for example, to connect in-person learners with remote learners through activities in the classroom, drive the socialization there, now is going to you know, continue, but also have to manifest in the interactions within the classroom. 
and it's going to have to be purposeful what mm -hmm. we're doing. Um, so we know that we're aware of that, but that socialization piece is a big, a, a big component of it, you know, and it, it does have to happen at that small group level. Unfortunately, we can't take an auditorium like this and fill it with kids and do assemblies and do all these wonderful things that we've done in the past, but we have to do those, those things with, uh, you know, counselors visiting classrooms and teachers doing wonderful things in the classroom. And I'm so excited about, you know, club activities and athletics and all the things that we're going to do to get students together in social situations to promote um, some of the things that they've been missing yeah. in the past. Great. Okay. I yield the balance of my time. <laughs> Wait, can I just, uh, just I, can I just throw in one question though related to the social emotional? Um, if we had the hybrid model, I, I know based on some of the commentary that I had read, I, I would be concerned that it might be hard for some students to forego the hybrid model because of their social um, anxiety um, and, and, and just the fear of, of the unknown. So I just wondered, you know, how that plays, is that a factor in, in determining um, why you were strongly recommending to not have the hybrid? Because I know some families yeah. still feel, you right. know, that it, it's, it's, it's upsetting to them to have had a model and then to have that model taken away. So, And, and I can understand that. Again, I have three children of my own at home. And so I, I get the adolescent piece of this where uh, the anxiety of returning to in-person and what that brings. And, and what I, I would just say to that is that if, if parents are, are experiencing those behaviors at home, um, I would encourage them to reach out to the school and make contact. Our school counselors need to know this information so we can help in that transition. If uh, children develop uh, any kind of school phobia or anxiety about it, they may not exhibit those behaviors in school, but they may verbalize those things at home. And so we would wanna know, and we wanna create that partnership with the home so that we can successfully transfer, transition students back into in-person learning. It's important. It's important if, that, if those are issues, it's important that we tackle those head on, we identify it, and, and we work with families to bring students back in. It's gonna, you know, the, the time period that we're in now, we can't let it impact our children going forward. We have to, we have to face these things. And so we're, we're prepared to do that. We understand the work that's ahead of us, but uh, it's important work. Thank you. And, and I imagine also um, offering the, the two additional opportunities um, to opt in may help ease that anxiety. You know, unlike the beginning of the year where we asked everybody, you know, to, to commit for a quarter by doing this in two weeks increments, it will allow some families that time to sit back and, um, and watch how things unfold and maybe they have anxiety over the spring break travel, right? And right. then they're able to make that next determination on, on April 19th. Right. Yep, absolutely. Hanson? Um, Rory, first off, I think you guys have done an amazing job so far to date with keeping the, the school safe. Um, just to preface this, my wife and I are both frontline workers. We are working with COVID every day. So we're privy to a lot of data. But this data you presented tonight, um, I have some concerns about the date and the timelines, only because if you look at all the data, the Suffolk County data, the Green Lawn data, Center for Data and Harbor Fields, you'll see a spike every time we have a week off. Yep. Okay. So after Thanksgiving, there was a spike. The data shows it. After the Christmas break, there was a spike. After February break, there's a small spike, but now we have the variants. And unfortunately, the rapid test today and some tests on the market do not pick up the variants. So there's a higher case of, of false negatives that are out there. And with the spring break coming up, I expect an increase in the positive cases. So this timeline, while I agree with getting the kids back to school, I think the timeline's a little aggressive. And if we wait till after the spring break a week and push that off a little more, I think it'll be a safer opening. Because if you look at the data after Thanksgiving quells down, you'll see a decrease. After the Christmas holidays, you'll see a decrease. My only concern is that if we start off, if we rush this too fast, you'll get a spike in cases and everything's gonna be shut down. So I, I like the plan. I just think the timing is a little off uh, because of the variants. And number two, the vaccinations are not available for children yet. They are available for teachers. That would help uh, um, with protecting the school as well. And, um, testing, you know, 
I work with about 37 schools throughout New York and 16 universities. And the schools that have been successful have a testing protocol so that these, these schools have been um, in person all year round. They have not done, done a hybrid model. So by testing these students every week, they had a successful opening. I'm not saying that we should require testing, um, but if that's an option that we can, um, if kids want to really come to school, maybe we should have some form of testing. Not the rapid test because they're not reliable, mm -hmm. but more the PCR type testing. Our kids um, gotta I go back, man. I have all the data. Um, while I like the plan, I just think the risk level is too high at this point. And this is our own data. This is the data you provided. Right. Yep. Um, if we can wait a week after the spring break, because I know people are going to go away, right? I know people are going to socialize. They're going to get together. And what happens when they do that? The numbers go up. The data shows it. There's data from last year that you have here during spring break last year. When we were shut down, the data, the cases went up in Greenlawn. So if you look from last year to this year, the cases have gone up. So the data supports it. The data is right here in front of us. And I'm correlating this with my Suffolk County data. I have Nassau County data. I have New York City data. It all tells the same story. Mm -hmm. And not surprisingly, this is the same thing in Harbor Fields as well. So that's my only concern. I'm, while, I, while I like the plan, I think the, um, we might be rushing it too, too much, or maybe we could phase in the seniors one week instead of the next day having the juniors come in, maybe wait another week and then wait another week and start phasing them in. And also having the hybrid option I think, um, so every kid is different uh, and every child may have a different health condition. So to force them to come to school and manage their anxiety by trying to ease them in may not be the best thing for them also. So I think having that hybrid option might be an option as well. So my only concern is I'm just looking at the data. The data, the surveys are great because it tells people how they feel, but the data is the truth. This is what's happening and this what can happen. Um, so I like, the, I like the notion that we want to get the kids back to school, but if we can have a, I would prefer a phase and approach as opposed to getting everything rushed in. Right. And this way we will have a good May, a great June, and probably a great graduation. Yeah. And so, you know, um, if I could just respond to that, I mean, we, we have thought about that quite a bit. Um, and I, I've made clear to, you know, the community, our thoughts on how we can all work together to, to stay open. Um, and I go back to that month of January where we had those 85 cases and we were, we were struggling. Um, and certainly if we reached that level, which I hope we never reach again, that would be problematic, but we were able to, to navigate that even in our K to five all in system. And so uh, that's why the recommendation, the recommended timeline is what it is. Uh, but I do, I'm not going to lie, I have the same concerns about, you know, community spread within that, that time period that we have a recess um, and coming back to a situation where we have increased number of cases. What gives me confidence is, again, our success within January to keep our schools open, as difficult as it was, and also the fact that we didn't see, um, you know, the, the school spread piece that, um, that I spoke about earlier. The other piece about the vaccine, it's a great, it's a great point. The vaccine rollout does provide um, some, some relief to those concerns for our, for our staff for certain. Um, what I'm hoping is that the New York State Department of Health adopts the CDC guidance, which says that vaccinated individuals do not need to quarantine if they're exposed. So currently that's not the case. I hope that that comes forward. And then as far as testing, you know, we've, we've explored, um, you know, different, different testing and you've, you've, you know, with the PCR versus rapid, we've been down that, that, that road with the conversation. It's, it becomes very cost prohibitive uh, and to run a full testing program, but certainly it's something that uh, we've, we've explored in the past. We couldn't mandate testing as a condition to attend school, but we could, uh, you know, certainly explore that again. Colleen, do you have a question? I, I have. Um, um, I'm okay, sorry. So I've been working with the uh, federal government. Uh, so Biden put it together. Task force. I don't think your mic is on. Oh. I'm sorry. So I've been working with the uh, CDC and the uh, Department of Defense, actually, um, and I talked to you about this. 
and they're setting up an initiative. I'm part of the initiative also, is to provide uh, free testing for students from K to eight. They're not gonna test nine to 12 because um, the CDC is going, going to lower their guidelines for the, uh, for the various vaccines. Right now, Pfizer is 16 and over, whereas Moderna and J&J &J are 18 and over, but they're looking to do, they're doing trials right now to get those uh, to a lower age. So um, we're putting in an RFP right now to get, um, somebody's gonna be testing um, the elementary schools from K to eight. And that's gonna happen rapidly. So if I'll keep you abreast on that, but the testing is going to be free. It's gonna be PCR based testing. Thank you. Okay. So um, kind of going back to the hybrid model question, um, it's, it sounds like uh, we're, some of that decision is being based on the, the possibility of kids not really, be, not really being any safer by uh, you know, doing a hybrid model. Does, does, any, um, does any of that come from any kind of guidance from Suffolk County or from the CDC you know, that the hybrid model really wouldn't protect kids any more than being in school full time? It really comes down to our experience of mm -hmm. where you know, the, the Suffolk County requirements are that when you have a positive case, you do a 48 hour look back from either when that child became, or that individual became symptomatic, right. or were tested positive. So if I started developing symptoms today and it's Wednesday, but I didn't get tested until Friday, and I attended school the entire week, you would have to start to look back the day I became symptomatic, Wednesday, two days prior to that, Monday and Tuesday. Hmm. So then there would be exposure all after that as well. So the the that's where that's where the the hybrid model, I question, you know, when people feel that they might be safer coming into school three days a week, two days a week, whatever the rotation works out to be, uh, they're still going to get caught up in that contact tracing if all other individuals, not all other, but a significant population of the high school or middle school is in five days a week mixing cohorts. Hmm. So um, that's where, you know, we, when we came down to those discussions about the efficacy of keeping the hybrid, it came down to a conversation about educational, social emotional goals that we have for our kids. Uh, and so that's why we're, we're looking to eliminate the hybrid option uh, in this plan. Got it, okay. And all desks in this program would have, uh, would have barriers set up for them in the OMS? In all, the all desks that were less than, where six feet of distance can't be maintained. Right, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. That's great, thanks. So just related to this, you know, it's not really hybrid, but if you have a, a all virtual student, right? Um, and I didn't see it in the plan, the all virtual student, will they be permitted to attend in-person after school activities, extracurriculars, sports, and then maybe Dr. May speak a little bit about then how that's, you know, managed and, and the safety uh, concerns there. Very good. So yes, uh, our virtual students can attend uh, those events and the contact tracing process would be the same uh, for those people. Is that the question? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. So yes, so they can attend, right. right? And then and then the student athletes or the students coming in for the extracurricular would still have to follow all the proper, you know, guidelines and procedures that are put in place by the school and the athletic guidelines that are in place as well. Yep, great question. So they, all of our athletes are temperature screened um, and they have to do the attestation that everybody has to do. Uh, and they all have to follow the same protocols of mask wearing and everything like that. And so if there is a positive case, the contact tracing occurs within the context of whatever they attended, a club, a sport. Um, but that's, that, that's the same, same process. So they can still be quarantined. We have a couple of... Um questions just based on things I had seen in uh, the surveys. C could you speak to, I know s some uh, parents had asked whether you could have staggered um, hallway times um, in between classes and also about arrival and dismissal and uh, teachers pushing in instead of students pushing out. So could you just um, speak to that to everyone that's listening? Yeah, so we explored the idea of um, staggered hallway times and unfortunately, the limited amount of time that students have to get from class to class, um, staggering that would be very disruptive to the educational environment. It would require, you know, eating up times of instructional periods. Uh, and that's not something that we would necessarily support. We look at our, hallway, our hallways 
And again, using the one-way directional hallways, the stairwells, uh, we've been successful uh, in, in keeping students safe. Uh, so that's the model that we're looking to, to keep. And the uh, other component, uh, you know, staggered dismissal times, same thing, very disruptive to the, uh, to the educational um, environment on that. And based on the students' uh, various schedules, you don't have the ability to have the kids you know, be planted oh, like yeah, in one right, room. Right, correct. So yeah, putting um, a student in, in one location and bringing teachers in um, is not something that we would be able to maintain with the secondary schedules. Thank you. And then I know um, one of the uh, questions that the community had wanted to know about was, so with this new model, what happens to the remote students that were um, still in those classes? Their schedule is not, uh, is not changing and the teacher will still be teaching to a percentage of students at home? Correct. So no student schedules would change. Um, students that were previously remote chose to come in person, they would attend the same classes that they attended virtually. Um, and students that were, were remote and stay remote, they'll still attend their classes as they did. Um, we, that's one strength of our model. I do have to say that it's not the same in all places, but uh, you know, those in districts where they chose to have fully remote teachers and, and there was a switch to in-person, obviously that impacts the, their ability to have the same teacher. So um, I know it's very difficult for our, our teachers, but they do a great job with it and our students benefit for sure because they maintain that con continuity of instruction. When they're quarantined, they don't go to a different teacher. They, they, they stay with their teacher and uh, it's been a strength of our program. Thank you. Chris, you had some more questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, can you speak, uh, just uh, speaking of the vaccines, do you have a sense of how, you know, a, a rough, rough percentage of uh, how much of our staff is vaccinated? I know that's probably a, a guess, right? I don't know if you have the exact numbers or not, but can but, you, do you have a anecdotal sense? Sure. How many? Yeah. So no, we, we, we don't have an accurate uh, percentage yeah. of, of the staff that's vaccinated. What I can tell you is that we, We've been trying to work with organizations to provide our staff with uh, the availability of vaccines throughout this process. And we've received tremendous level of interest from our staff on that. So I know that a very good portion of our staff want to be vaccinated if they're not already vaccinated. I do hear anecdotally that the vaccination appointments are opening up. And people mm -hmm. are getting more successful at getting appointments. I do hear that, um, if not the first shot, they get the second shot. I, I do hear progress in those things. But most recently we work with the Suffolk County Superintendents Association, who was able to work with the Suffolk County Department of Health to get doses specifically for our special education teachers and teacher assistants. So when we put that information out to our staff, we got a tremendous response uh, from those certified individuals. And so we know carrying that out, that a, the, a good majority of our staff are either in the process or interested in getting That's vaccinated. Good. I have no doubt. Can you um, maybe, I don't know if it's possible, but can you, can you speak for the staff for a minute and just talk about you know, their um, eagerness for this plan or, or the concerns they've expressed to you and kind of just from their perspective about what, how they're feeling about full-time? Yeah, so this was a, you know, obviously a process that's been going on for a long time. We've met with, um, all different staff members in trying to get them uh, to provide input and provide uh, feedback and to be able to, you know, brainstorm with us on, on all these different things this is something we've been working on obviously for a long time. Uh, and in that process, a lot of thoughts have evolved. As I said, we, it goes from hybrid to, you know, in person and and the process I have to say has been so wonderful because what you see in the discussions and how we evolve is, you know, everybody's educators at heart. I really don't care what your role is here. Everybody, you know, our custodians, our nurses, our security guards, we're all, we all work with kids. And at the end of the day, while people sure, surely have concerns about what if, what if, you know, if, you know, if there's increased number of individuals, quarantines, exposure, Right, those are all genuine concerns that uh, that people might have, but at the end of the day, 
I haven't seen such tremendous outpouring of work into how can we make this happen? Mm -hmm. And and I, again, I can't say enough about how much I appreciate that. Um, it's been, it's been not a day that I could walk down the hallway and people asking about what's the plan, what's the plan, what's the plan, you know, yeah. and it's in a good way of, I was at the Foreign Language Honor Society induction today and I had previously sent a letter out to the staff um, to earlier today uh, just to talk to them a little bit about what they're going to see tonight. And, um, you know, the staff there were, were very supportive and very excited to hear that there's, there's going to be a plan for, like this. And again, I'm not going to sit here and say that there's not individuals that have concerns about um, what, what might happen and some of the concerns that were raised tonight, but we're working to put every, every stopgap in place to make sure that everybody's right. as safe as we can possibly make them. Um, just a couple of quick ones too. Um, um, I, I really, I like the flexibility of the plan, the, the uh, sort of the space there. I think you mentioned this Susie, this sort of the one week and the two week without a huge timeline to come back. So I really like that flexibility. I, I just remember back in August, a lot of people being nervous about in the lower grades going back full time and wanting wanting that two week flexibility and just sort of the unknown is is kind of nerve wracking. So I, I really like the flexibility. The um, thinking about the staggered sort of uh, comeback here, the seniors first and, and the different grades, um, is there any flexibility or any um, any way to get to target maybe like uh, kids with IEPs to get them back even sooner? Is there a way to kind of kickstart uh, those kids um, maybe first, even even faster if there's space or you know is there any any sort of way to to work that? Yeah, it it really came down to um, to a calculation of of desks and rooms and space and barriers and all those things. So when we looked at it putting, you know, even the, the seniors and putting them in the classrooms, there wasn't, we just didn't have the, the desk to do that. Yeah. Um, and so when we can't fully offer it, but for your example, whether it's our ENL students, our special education students, our homeless population, our, you know, we, we have to be careful about making sure that whatever we offer, we can accommodate the full population uh, of individuals. And so unfortunately that wasn't, wasn't the case. Um, the decision to bring back our seniors on uh, March 22nd. And again, keep in context that that particular week, a senior might have either two days of in-person or three days of in-person. So that senior experience I know is only a couple of days, maybe three days that week for them, but it's, uh, it's a kickstart for them because we know that our seniors have graduation requirements that need to be met. They have you know, some AP exams that are coming up. They, and of course, a plethora of senior events that we want to get them involved in. Uh, and give them, you know, the last portion of their life at Harborfields here uh, a little bit of uh, yeah. a little bit of a jump start. Um, one last question. I hate to even ask this question. Um, maybe I shouldn't, but I'll ask it anyway. The <laughs> uh, no, no, it's not that bad. Uh, the emer you know, is is the emergency backup plan? I guess to go. If, if you know if things aren't going well to go back to what we have now is that kind of I, I, I'm not sure if that was in the uh, in the plan but would that be you know if, if if we find that this is not working we just we go back or so we we're very confident that this is going to work right um, so I don't I don't want to say that we would go back to the current hybrid model we we're confident that we can make this work mm -hmm. um, the challenge is going to be if we experience a situation like we had in January, but again, I fall back to our success. Mm -hmm. Not one day did we shift to remote. Uh, we were able to, to keep our buildings open and we were able to do it effectively. I think that the challenge that we faced with the staff, and I don't mean in a, in a, in a negative way, it's just staffing the buildings, I should say. When you have to quarantine individuals uh, and you, you, know, you have to make sure that your buildings can run, the children are supervised, um, I'm hoping that a little bit is mitigated by the fact that maybe the New York State Department of Health adopts that CDC guidance that vaccinated individuals do not need to quarantine right. and we're able to avoid that. But even if, and again, I hope we never visit January again, um, we feel that we're prepared to handle that, that type of situation. So I don't have um, hybrid as a fallback option. I'm keeping remote and in-person as, as our model. Go, okay. 
Chris, I actually had that question too, so you're good. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I mean, and the reality is, if we bring everyone in, right, and then there's a crazy spike, whether that's from the vacation or from behave from other behaviors, then the first step would be an individual classroom that would quarantine. I mean, closing a whole building would be the result of probably a fairly large uh, yeah. spread. As we said in in throughout the year, we said the same thing. Really, the, the few things that would cause us to go remote for a period of time. And that was, you know, the inability to staff the building, as I said before, executive order, uh, or, you know, the combination of community spike with the evidence of school spread. And those things that, you know, I know all the districts have been in the same position where they've had to maybe shift to remote for a week to try to investigate and see, make sure that everything's good. I don't, I'm cer certainly hopeful that won't happen to us. Um, but I feel like, again, going back to our experiences in January, certainly prepared us that we can be successful with this. I mean, and I know we, we talked about that you, we can't mandate um, testing for, for entry into the building that's not, that's not um, permitted, but could we suggest in a friendly way that people that do a lot of socializing over a vacation um, take that PCR test so that we don't start off with a problem? So, you know, that's a, it's a good question. And that's part of the reason why I did offer that flexibility. Um, if, if folks are concerned about their exposure uh, and they're quarantined, obviously they participate in live remote instruction, it's, it's no issue. But if they're um, concerned about exposure and they, they wanna get tested, uh, I would just encourage those families to work with the schools. Our, our, our buildings, you know, work with our families all the time. And each individual case is different, but you know, we just ask that everybody remain responsible. Uh, so uh, again, I have three children at home and I understand the pressures to get together and bring them to places, but I just encourage you to wear your mask because that's the most effective way to mitigate uh, the spread um, and uh, keep everybody safe and keep our schools open. We wanna finish the year strong. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're not quarantining ind individuals. Uh, we have some pretty, great experiences coming up with, this, with the activities happening at the end of the year. And uh, we're looking forward to all of them. Uh, and so I wanna see that happen. I want everybody in school. And I just wanna add, I, 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 I totally hear Hanson's um, concern over the vacation and I understand all the spikes, um, but at the same time, like you said, and, and granted, we didn't have full capacity in our secondary level, but we were able to manage um, those spikes and we, we're not switching to a, a hybrid model for our primary level who will also be on spring break, a lot of them with, with, their, with their family. So, you know, from a equitable uh, position, it, it's, it would seem appropriate that we would move, if we're advocating for a full in um, after the vacation, that that's an appropriate recommendation. Uh, I, uh, I still have some concerns uh, you saw the huge spike in January, right? And that was coupled with people going vacation and also the flu season, right? So that, that was a, a mitigating factor. Now we're approaching April and May. You know what that season is? It's allergy season. People start sneezing. The risk of transmission is higher. When they go away, you're gonna see a spike. Yeah, um, I'm predicting that there's going to be a spike. The CDC is predicting that there's going to be a spike. How we handle that is if we can push this off a week, I think it'll be a lot safer. And with regard to the PCR test, a lot of people are not taking the PCR test. Every time they come to me for a test, they said, what if I'm positive? Are you gonna tell on me? I said, I'm required by law to report it to Suffolk County, okay? Suffolk County actually is the high, is, has the highest number of cases in New York State right now. So that's another one of my concerns as well. So we have allergy season coming up, which is here right now. Suffolk County is the highest cases in New York State. And people don't want to take the PCR test because they're concerned that they're going to be reported. So what they do is they, they're probably positive, but they sit at home and wait it out. After 10 days, that's a quarantine time, right? You can still test as positive. There's people that have tested positive after 60 days or 73 days. They're still carriers of the virus, but they don't test, so we don't know. People don't want to take, take the test because they don't want to get reported. Right now, people are getting the vaccine. I know people that have gotten the vaccine after the first shot, they tested positive, but they're afraid to get a COVID. I mean, I'm sorry, they, 
they get symptoms. They're afraid to test for COVID because they're afraid that if they test positive for COVID, they can't get the second vaccine. So there's a lot of um, moving pieces that are out there um, that concerns me. I'm, I'm all for the plan. I think kids should go back to school. We have a hybrid option, that's great also. If we just push it out just one week, just all I'm asking is one week, it, it will make a huge difference. This is my only concern. I don't know, I, I don't know I don't how you so. about that. I don't know if you guys are okay with the plan, but I have a problem with coming right back from vacation and not knowing what the risk are. We're rolling the dice right now. If we wait a week and look at the data, if the data says, hey, we're safe, let's come back, get the kids back to school. I want the kids to come back to school. The weather's gonna get warmer. There'll be opportunities to be outside. We'll keep the teachers safe. We'll keep the staff safe. We'll keep the kids safe. My one question with that is if people are reluctant to go get the test, I'm not sure that they're going to be testing anymore a week after the vacation as, as a week well, before the be, vacation. And also their allergies aren't going to go away after the vacation. If they go away, they're going to be required to be tested because every airline is going to allow, uh, require to get. My daughter just went away today. She had to get two PCR tests. That gets reported to the to Suffolk County or New York State. Every test that I've, I've done, so many tests, right? I have to report every single positive to Suffolk County Department of Health. And some people beg me not to report them because, oh, I have to go, to, I want to go to school, or I have to go to work, or no, we have to report you. So there is a reluctance to do, even if you do, uh, even for the rapid test, you go down the street, you get a rapid test, it still gets reported. So uh, there's a little quandary here. We, it, it's hard to manage. We can't control the behavior of the community. But if we want the schools to be open, then we have to really hope that the community can be responsible as well as the kids. Well, That's Hanson, I, I will just add to, to this uh, discussion here and say that I think the community has been extremely responsible to this point. Um, uh, the success of the school uh, has been, you know, partly due to, uh, to the responsibility of the community. Uh, the community has done a tremendous job um, with this. Um, and yes, have we seen spikes? Sure, we've seen spikes. Uh, that's going to be normal. I think the plan addresses the spikes. Um, the, the fact that the instructional models is outlined in the plan allows you know teachers to continue to teach uh, to both the virtual student and the in-person student. In the event we have a spike after a break, as you're suggesting, and, and it's a sound rationale you're, you're providing for that, and I think we, we're all aware of that. Um, but the plan addresses it. And if we were to have a spike and we did have groups that did have to quarantine because of that spike, those students still would be attending school, but just virtually for that period of time and they wouldn't skip a beat, right? And they would stay with their classes, the same schedule, and they would just do that from home for the, for the 10 days or so or whatever the guideline is at that point before they can return to in-person. So you, you bring up a valid point. Um, I'm, I'm confident from what I'm hearing and reading in the plan that, that we, we will be able to address that successfully. And I'm confident in the community based upon what this community has done over the past uh, six months of the school year, that uh, people will continue to, to uh, be responsible and, and do their part to make sure the schools remain open. Thank you, Dave. Does anyone else want to um, weigh in? Sorry, kids gotta go back. Uh, I just kind of, I thought maybe to just go around if anyone has any uh, closing remarks because the, the, end, the end goal of tonight is to, um, it's not a formal meeting, but the um, objective is that um, we're giving permission for Dr. Manning to release um, the commitment uh, form tomorrow. And then at the Board of Education meeting next Wednesday would be when we would give the, um, the update on the supplies and he would be confirming um, the timeline. So on that, Susie, I'll say, uh, and I think as it ties in with the discussion so far, uh, obviously there's been a, a tremendous outpouring from the community in terms of which way they want to go. And, and obviously uh, a lot of the community would like to see school return. Uh, I think, you know, with that, uh, with the amount of, you know, vigor and zest that people kind of reached out about this and, and kind of what we're hearing in the community, that if people, you know, kind of double down on the on the on being safe outside of school, uh, you know, I think that that does kind of uh, address how we can kind of be successful here. So, uh, I, I implore the community to really, um, uh, if this is really what everybody wants, let's all do this, not just to send kids to school, but to be even more safe uh, in our our, our personal events. 
Uh, and if we do travel to states where there's no mask mandates anymore and we're in you know, kind of uh, questionable situations, you know, maybe, maybe do the remote thing until they can opt in on April 19th. So I think it's gonna be some personal decisions being made. Uh, I think if everybody can try to be responsible, not only for themselves, but for the betterment of the community, uh, I do think that the plan is a sound one. I, I support it. Uh, I'd like to see kids, you know, that want to be in school and parents that want to have their kids in school do it as soon as possible. So I, I think we can roll this out. We, we realize there's going to be, uh, you know, some, some expected spike and some expected effect to the school district for sure. But we've got, we've got, a, uh, we, we've got a, a remote scenario that would kind of address that. So uh, I, I, I support it. Thank you, Steve. Sure. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I think that for the, the social, emotional, and academic health of our children, we need to get our children back to school. I am comfortable with this plan. I think that all our, our community, our teachers, our staff, and, and our administrators have done a wonderful do job at this point with the current plan. And I see, I have no objections to moving forward with this plan and putting our students back fully into school. Thank you, Joe. Anyone else? Chris? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to get kids the opportunity to get back in school full time, really eager. And, uh, you know, um, I feel Hanson's apprehension as someone being on the front lines there and seeing what's going on. Um, a lot of apprehensions everywhere. It's, um, you know, and I, I really, I feel for families who are, um, who are hybrid right now, comfortable with the situation and are not comfortable with the choice of full-time or remote. I really, um, you know, I feel for, for the people who are right on the fence there, it's, it's a hard decision, but, uh, you know, I think with the vaccines out, with all our experience, um, the thoroughness that you guys have shown um, you know, the warmer weather coming, the windows are going to be open. Um, the kids have shown resilience with the mask. I think incredible resilience with the mask. Um, you know, I think it's time to, to move forward. Thank you, Chris. Is anyone, anyone else? I just would like to add that, um, I do feel also for every community member that is struggling to make a decision that was comfortable with hybrid or was comfortable with remote and it becomes all the harder when you're gonna see um, your children are gonna watch their peers coming in for a, a full day. This is um, not an easy decision. It's a very emotional time for, for, for everybody. Um, we all wish that we could rewind to uh, 2019 but I think our school district has methodically worked through this process and we have been successful. And I really believe that Dr. Manning and the um, cabinet and the administrators on the building levels are prepared with the tools now to handle things and to pivot and um, adjust as necessary. And like Dr. Manning said, when he opened this, it was a year ago that we began to shut down and it's been a very long emotional year for every parent, every community member and especially every student. And I hope that we will partner together and make good choices so that we can open fully after the April um, break for parents who are reluctant or concerned. And of course, we understand your concern. You will have two opportunities to be able to opt back in. Um, so I think that really does provide the flexibility for everybody. And with that, I believe we have a consensus to um, direct Dr. Manning to release a commitment form to the parents tomorrow. Okay. With that, I'd like to make a motion to um, and our meeting. Make one, um, one, okay. one, one quick statement, which is just quickly to thank everybody. As I said, when I opened, we, we would not be here today without the work of the staff uh, to, to keep our buildings safe, keep our buildings open. That's everybody, uh, soup to nuts. Uh, but also to or, you know, our community members for their support and, and thanks to our Board of Education who has been so supportive of our programs. And, and you know, I remember the days of the, the tour that we went around the buildings in October and 
Um, it was uh, it was wonderful to to provide insight into the operation of schools, and I look forward to the success of the program. I really see bright future ahead, uh, and I'm excited. I'm excited to get the kids back in the schools and the hallways noisy again, for sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manning. I'd like to make a mo uh, have a motion to close the meeting. All in favor? Aye. Good night, everyone. Aye. We'll see you at our meeting next week. Thank you.